you can now find me on Roadster, the app connecting people through cars. Hello everybody, you join me today for what I consider one of my automotive palette cleansers. No, I know it's very easy to believe that all of us YouTubers are simply obsessed with the newest, the latest, the greatest, the biggest, the fastest, the most powerful. That simply isn't true. I certainly have an appreciation for all of that. I'd be a massive hypocrite if I said that I didn't. But I also find great enjoyment in simple, back to basics motoring and today I'm able to indulge in a little bit of that and explore a car that I think is really rather overlooked. Today you find me behind the wheel of a Mark 1 MR2. These are already a rather unusual thing, but this one is particularly special because it's one of the Japanese and American market only supercharged cars. I have previously driven a Mark 1 Mr. 2, powered by the fabled 4AGE 1.6 litre engine, the same thing you'll find in the AE86. In those, it makes just over 120 horsepower. This is the same displacement indeed. The engine still has the same 4A prefix. This is a GZE, the Z I think being the supercharged bit. Given the regular car makes around 120 odd horsepower, you might reasonably expect this would make 160, 170, maybe even 180. Uh, but it in fact makes only 145 so about 20 more than the regular car. It doesn't even have the T-Viz variable intake system that the regular engine does. The upside though is that it should have a little bit more torque more of the time. Even better, the supercharger is actually driven via a clutch, which is then electronically controlled, meaning when it's not needed, like now, it's not actually active. There's a little light on the dash to tell you when it is, now it is, and this car, I can tell you, really does benefit from it because it's actually got some low down grunt, something the regular car is certainly lacking. Though the MR2 existed in three very distinct generations, I think it's fair to say that it's the second of them which gets all of the attention. That's the one that looks a little bit like a Ferrari and is often used as the basis for many a Ferrari replica. The third generation then is the one that looks a little bit like a Boxster. And strangely, for both the first and second generation car, we simply never got the spiciest version. So here, the supercharged one, and later, the MR2 Turbo. I'm not quite sure why we didn't get that car, because we got the Celica GT4, which has more or less the same engine in it. Still, thanks to some very generous import legislation, many of these grey market cars found their way to our shores, particularly in the 1990s when a very, very favourable yen to pound exchange rate meant that it was actually quite cheap to bring cars over. You even found in many cases people importing cars that you could buy here from Japan simply because the price difference was that great. I know several motorbike companies that were put out of business by this because, let's be honest here, a quick sticker on the Speedo and you've essentially converted your bike from KPH to MPH. For a few thousand pounds saving, people were more than happy to make the sacrifice. Anyway, back to this car. This particular one is a 1988 model, and it's been in its current owner's possession for 18 years. I want to say a big thank you to Gordon for letting me out in it, because it is an absolute delight. It looks superb in this red, which is not actually its original colour. This is a Toyota shade, but the car was originally white and silver. The reason for the change is simple. He wanted a red supercharged one, thanks to some nostalgic association, but simply couldn't find one. 
He has owned five of these in total, so I think it's fair to say he's got a bit of a thing for them. The later generations really never held the same appeal. As it happens, if you have a decent or particularly unusual example of a Mark II or three MR2, those are both cars I think I need to revisit. So if you've got one that you'd be happy for me to drive, please do drop me a line. My email address is in the description of every video. One of the strangest things about the MR2 lineage is that you would expect, reasonably so, for the last to also be the heaviest, when it was in fact the lightest by quite some margin. Even the most trim and svelte of Mark I MR2 still weighs over a tonne, with this being about 1.1, thanks to some extra stuff relating to the engine and its increased power output. Let's ignore all the numbers for just a minute though, and see what this car's really like to simply enjoy. You know, I came down this road about half an hour ago in my 700 horsepower Ferrari F12. And I'd be doing you all a great disservice if I didn't tell you that right about now, I'm having a lot more fun in this for several reasons. First off, to try and put your foot all the way in the Ferrari and hold it there until the red line is terrifying. Secondly, that's an enormous car, takes up all of the road and occasionally a little bit more. Thirdly, the view out of this is absolutely sensational. It may be a bit of an origami masterpiece with rather divisive styling. I don't actually like it that much. But from in here, you can see everything. You're in a sort of rectangular goldfish bowl. Wonderful. Ordinarily, in any sort of convertible, I operate a strict policy of if it's sunny, or at least not raining, I'll have the roof down. This car has the little T-bar arrangement people mostly associate with the second gen MR2, but for today, they're staying on. The strange thing is though, that with the window only slightly open, I still feel like I'm getting the full convertible experience. Space in here actually isn't that bad either. This car's owner is a fairly tall chap, and he struggled to get in a 944. You'd think that it would be much easier to get in that than one of these. However, with those, there is no adjustment whatsoever for the wheel, and it's pretty large. He simply can't get his legs past it. In this, he's actually got room to spare. Though these have a bit of a reputation for fairly edgy handling, this car actually doesn't seem to be that bad. The only time it broke away was extremely smooth, progressive, and it's one of the few times I actually went looking to see if I could get the same thing to happen, because it wasn't sketchy at all. The Goodyear Efficient Grip tyres on this, I think, probably suit it quite well. If you put really sticky rubber on, I think it would just give it an unpleasant or harsh breakaway characteristic. The fact is that these more eco-minded tyres are probably fairly close to what these originally had. The steering is reasonably light, but communicates its intentions fairly well. The gear lever is a very, very suggestive shape, but the action, quite pleasant, quite nice. Second, I'm told, on occasion is a little bit tricksy, but this has a short throw, very little play in it. Pedals set up perfectly for heel and toe. Very enjoyable to heel and toe. Much is made of the connection between the Mark I, MR2 and Lotus, with some people going so far as to say this was actually an abandoned Lotus design. That's not true at all. But it is true that Lotus's Roger Becker did have some involvement with this car, and you can tell. It's got that same delicacy, that same lightness of touch that characterized some of the very best cars to come from Hethel. I'm actually, to give you an example of just how enjoyable this car is, on a downhill section with absolutely no throttle whatsoever, and it's just the most delicious thing to just fingertip, gently glide through this section. Oh, wondrous. The supercharged engine, though it still doesn't have lots and lots of poke, has completely changed the character of this car, and for me, really improved it. Whereas before you needed to get the engine to about 4,000 for it to wake up, here you can drive it off the mid-range and still make 
perfectly ample progress. The fact is, I've barely really even touched the speed limit here, but you can carry plenty of speed through the bends, and because it's quite a narrow car, you can pick your line and really enjoy it. This car has only a few reasonably subtle modifications. It has poly bushes throughout. It's got KYB dampers, which are made essentially to OE specification. It's got the regular springs on it. The most noticeable change though is the exhaust. Happily though, what Gordon has put on here isn't actually all that dramatic. And it makes for me exactly the right amount of noise. As it's also a car that came from the factory without a catalytic converter, it does smell rather fruity. <laughs> Woo! Those trees are a very pretty colour. For the Doug enthusiast out there, let's also give you some fun things about the first gen MR2. One of the reasons they're so heavy is because they have no fewer than five bulkheads in them. I assume two is a more normal number, the upside being that it's actually a reasonably stiff car, and despite the fact it's got essentially no roof, scuttle shake isn't a huge issue. It's there, I'd be lying if I said that it wasn't, but it's not a distraction. The seasoned Doug watcher I'm sure will also have noticed the rather unconventional controls for the lights and the windscreen wipers. Not related to this car, but I was driving this road earlier and I happened to see a man enjoying a Peugeot 205 T16. Now that's a spot. We've mentioned already this car was available as a supercharged one only in America or Japan. This one is a Japanese import. It wasn't, however, the only car to get this engine. There were a few Corollas that got it and I think one or two other vehicles, but they were all exclusive to the Japanese market. Which is a shame, because although a lot of people really lust after the 4AGE, and I get why, I think I prefer this. It's a more usable, more drivable lump and really suits the character of this car quite well and gives it for me some better GT credentials. In fact, this section of the road I drove in a Sora earlier and this is better damped. This is more comfortable. That's just not right. Perhaps the pièce de résistance of Doug Facts though for the Mark 1 MR2 Supercharged is that at the back you will find an engine lid with two vents on it, only one of which actually works. The other looks like it's real, but is in fact solid moulded plastic. The reasoning for this is that the intercooler is on the left hand side. More worryingly is the fact that the battery is also there and has a little metal tray holding it in place that is perilously close to the terminals. They're separated only by a fairly small piece of rubber. This thing is absolutely gorgeous. I hate looking at it, I mean I really do. They're distinctive and that's about all I'll give them. Looks are subjective, as everybody is generally keen to remind me, and I know my tastes are not the same as everybody's. But in terms of an experience, in terms of the drive, which is what I really wanted to talk to you all about today, this is magic, absolute magic. It's also nice to see one of these in really good condition, well kept by its owner. If you want to know some more boring stuff, I'll tell you about that in just a minute, because this section here is where I think this car is really going to shine. downside of this engine seems to be the fact that when you get to about five and a half to six thousand rpm it does lose all interest the red line is at seven and a half but honestly the car simply does not want to go there so the boring stuff then well in terms of fuel economy ah uh, we don't know i did ask and we don't know it's probably not really going to be all that bad though in fairness i don't expect it to be dramatically worse than the regular car if anything might be a little bit better 
parts availability is becoming a little bit of a struggle with certain things having to be sourced from unusual places including one piece that came from Dubai and that I found very interesting because when I was searching for a spare headlight for my Celica that's where I got that too general running and maintenance costs is reasonably low. Insurance was particularly cheap, £92 a year on an agreed valuation limited mileage policy. In truth, my experience with this type of classic car tells me that that's not really a particularly unusual figure. Prices for these are also actually reasonably sensible given what the market's been doing of late and the fact they are now quite a rare thing you'd be expecting to pay around the sort of eight to ten thousand pound mark for the upper end of these with quite a bit less for ropier examples or project cars however some people out there are asking sums of around twenty thousand pounds for these but we're not convinced those are sums actually being achieved that section of road is terrible that's a genuinely awful bit of road this should be horrible across it and i would forgive it entirely but it's not absolute joy I love this little thing, I really do. You have storage, both front and rear, not masses of it, but enough. And in here there's actually ample space for two people. Toyota even had the good graces to give you somewhere to put your iPhone 20 years before it was invented. Now that's forward thinking, that's the kind of stuff we should expect more of from the Japanese. I imagine in the GR Corolla they've put somewhere for you to store your ray gun. I'm doing 60 mile an hour, look, see how I'm not blurred this camera or nothing. 60 mile an hour with a big smile on my face. Because I love cars. I don't always love speed, I don't always love power, sometimes I do. But I just love cars and this is a lovable car if ever there were one. That, I think, is all that needs to be said on that. I'm sure I've missed lots and lots of stuff out. So, if you are a Mark 1 MR2 aficionado and there's something you think would be nice to share with the rest of the class, please pop into the comments section. Let us know what you know. Don't forget to hit the like button. Subscribe if you haven't already. And we'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.